And that's after Newsroom South East with Tim Ewart and Gwenan Edwards. Live from the M25, angry protesters confront the road lobby as the minister gives the go-ahead for motorway widening. Postal workers strike as the unions warn the traditional post office could soon be extinct. And a Downing Street Bravery Award for the model who fought back after losing a leg. Good evening. Yes to M25 widening, no to the M12. The government announced its revised roads programme today and there'll be a significant impact in the southeast. The central part of the east-west trunk route won't go ahead, nor will two northern bypasses planned for Oxford. Details of the controversial M25 scheme will be unveiled next week. Our transport correspondent Simon Montague joins us live now from the M25. Simon. Yes, indeed. I'm here near Egham in Surrey, right on top of the stretch of road which the government's decreed is now the most important road scheme in Britain, one they urgently want to get on with. The Roads Review, of course, is driven by both the, uh, the need to prioritise the most important schemes and also to try and lift the blight uh, caused by others, which the government's now decided won't be built for many years. Britain's busiest motorway remains top priority for both the government and anti-roads campaigners tonight. Transport ministers say widening to 14 lanes between the M3 and M4 must go ahead immediately, and they'll be publishing detailed proposals and an environmental assessment next week. We believe that this is the best way forward because at the moment there are a lot of people on the M25 who don't even want to be on the M25. They're getting their junction hopping and if we can relieve the pressure with link roads it will mean that the M25 will operate as the hub of the motorway network and the London bypass without clogging up the towns. But there's huge opposition in Surrey where Tory MPs are vowing to fight on. This scheme will never happen uh, in my view. The opinion that in the business really and in transport and the environment is in favour of finding alternative means to actually cope with traffic congestion and not just build extra lanes and it just happens that this is really the last battle of the old war and we haven't lost it yet. As Newsroom South East revealed six weeks ago, a new M12 motorway through the Essex countryside has been dropped. That's delighted local campaigners. There will be joy in the streets and jubilation everywhere. Uh, it's going to mean that people now are not going to be blighted with their houses. Uh, we're not going to have the noise, the pollution. We're going to free this part of the countryside of an unwanted motorway. Plans to widen the M25 between junctions 12 and 15 will go to public inquiry this year. A similar inquiry into the section between 15 and 16 will follow. Elsewhere, the M12 is dropped completely. The biggest surprise is the east-west trunk route. The central section between Stansted and the A5 is withdrawn. And two bypasses around Oxford, seen as extensions of the trunk route, have unexpectedly also been cancelled. Local planners are both surprised and relieved. It's now realised that you cannot go on building roads to solve traffic problems. Roads lead to more traffic and more traffic problems and that what has to happen is a more balanced approach to dealing with transport, an integrated approach. Other major schemes in the region remain high priority. They include widening the M2 and M20 in Kent, the M23 to Gatwick and M4 in Berkshire. In London, Oxley's Wood was saved by the withdrawal of plans for the East London River crossing last summer. A review of future Thames crossings will be published later this year. Well, of course, there are a couple of other schemes that have also been dropped. The A1-M1 link, that's at Scratchwood in North London, and long-term plans, plans for a possible outer orbital route uh, around the home counties, those also now have been dropped. Behind me in the distance is uh, a modern housing estate very close to the M25 and the people there fear they'll be very badly affected by the plans for the link roads. With me is uh, Muriel Brown. She's one of the residents there and Muriel, if I can ask you, what's your reaction to today's news the government wants to press on with widening the motorway? Well, to be perfectly honest, I'm absolutely devastated. Uh, I live in a one-bedroom flat that we purchased right at the top of the, the market. Uh, we've lost about £30,000 on it up to now, and as you can see, I've got a baby. We've no chance of moving out of the property. 
We were hoping that this motorway link road would be scrapped. It's a ridiculous idea. Nobody thought it was seriously going to go ahead. And to hear the news today, it is really, really bad for the Egg all of the Egham residents. It's not going to make life easier for people in Egham. What, what do you think it'll be like for your family and you personally? Well, I mean, if you can imagine, it's not so bad at the moment with a little baby in a one-bedroom flat. I'm on the second floor, by the way, with no lift. Uh, but you can imagine when he's five or six years old, he wants to play out, he wants a bike, this type of things. He won't be able to have them. Uh, I just want to give, give my child a good life, the same as anybody. Well, Andy Farrow, you, uh, what can you say to all that? You're from the British Roads Federation, you support the M25 link roads. What do you say to people like Muriel? What I'd say is that the government must adequately compensate people who are affected. If they're not willing to buy the property at an increased value and are above that of your initial mortgage, then they shouldn't go ahead with the plans. There are some very real problems with the M25 widening and there are some people who are adversely affected. Having said that, uh, the M25 nationally is a road that is of major importance. And if, if the problem will not go away simply by not widening it. If we don't widen it, traffic will be forced off the motorway and onto local roads and um, right past the places where, where people live. So briefly, you're very convinced the link roads must still go ahead? I think the link roads must go ahead, but people also must be properly compensated. And if the government isn't prepared to do that, then it should drop the plans. Well, there we have it. Uh, very different views about the M25 link roads. The plans, of course, to be announced in just eight days' time. And with that, back to you, Tim. And that's a, a story I expect we'll be hearing a lot more about. The Liberal Democrats today called for the main political parties to join forces to, force, to fight the right-wing British National Party in the May local elections. They want a pact to try to stop the BNP winning any more seats in the East End. But it's likely Labour will reject the deal. They're the Liberal Democrats' main opponents in the area. Here's our local government correspondent, Andrew Hoskin. The Isle of Dogs already has one BNP councillor and Labour and the Liberal Democrats are desperate to stop them getting another two, which would give them control of the area. But with London going to the polls on May the 5th, time's running out. The Liberal Democrats tried to take the initiative today by calling on all mainstream parties to stand aside in the crucial Isle of Dogs ward of Millwall, leaving the field clear for three non-political candidates chosen by the local community. We accept that in many ways people feel let down by the three main established parties um, and we cannot ignore those perceptions. We are so concerned about the possible rise of fascism in this country that we are prepared to go to the lengths of standing aside ourselves, if necessary in order to make sure that it is defeated. The initiative seems doomed to fail. Millwall was a Labour stronghold before the BNP victory last September and Labour insists it alone can defeat the far right. We certainly are determined to defeat the BNP and we want to attract support from all across the board but all the evidence shows that it is Labour that is rightly and strongly placed to win and that the Liberal Democrats are nowhere. Now frankly if we were to stand down and do some kind of deal with them this would confuse the message and a lot of people uh, I think would have doubts as to really where their allegiances should lie. Now that actually is a recipe for letting the BNP in. Labour's refusal could force the Liberal Democrats to stand down in Millwall or risk more victories for the BNP by splitting the vote. More than half the main post offices in London and Oxfordshire were closed by a one-day strike today. It was a protest against the policy of franchising, under which many post offices have been shut and services switched to shops and supermarkets. The unions warned that soon there may be no traditional post offices left. Brian Milligan reports. 115 post offices across the region were closed to customers today, including 60% of the offices in London. Counter staff were on strike to protest about the new types of post office they say aren't as good. They also marched on Parliament to demand an end to a closure programme that's already shut more than 100 offices in London alone. My worst fears are that uh, eventually that, uh, every single main crown post office will close. Uh, the posters will not give us one a guarantee on any number and their view is that uh, if they have the right offer in terms of uh, money being offered by uh, potential agencies or franchises, then every single office is up for grabs. The franchise programme means post office counters are being reopened in shops like this one. The staff are employed by the new company, in this case a stationer's. Managers say the whole process is likely to continue and deny that standards of service or training are lower. 
everything you can do in a directly owned post office, you can do in a, in, in, in a franchised outlet and in a modified outlet, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sub post office. It would be commercial suicide for me to give training, inadequate training, and for the post office to give inadequate, inadequate training for these new, these new outlets. With many of the franchise post offices opening in out-of-town supermarkets, one fear is they'll be more inaccessible for those without cars. The post office says it'll listen to any complaints about that, but says most customers prefer the new facilities. Brown Milligan reporting, and still to come tonight. The legacy of the dockyard, how Chatham's coping ten years on. The British train drivers learning the ways of the continent and a Downing Street Bravery Award for the model who lost a leg. But first other news, here's Gwenon. One workman was killed and another injured when a boiler exploded at Whips Cross Hospital in East London today. Two other men were treated for shock. The dead man took the full force of the blast. The explosion happened just before nine this morning as four workmen were carrying out routine maintenance. One engineer, 30-year-old Glenn Hibble, was standing on top of the boiler when a steam valve blew off. He was killed. A colleague suffered minor burns. We understand that the crown valve on top of the boiler split. Unfortunately, the member of staff on top of the boiler took the full force of the explosion and was killed. He was certified dead at the scene. Health and safety inspectors are carrying out a full investigation. The boiler room, one of five, is separate from the hospital buildings and no patients were at risk. The London commercial radio station LBC has gone into receivership, but the receivers say it will continue to broadcast while they negotiate the sale of the station to the new franchise holders, London News Radio. LBC decided to call in the receivers last night after its hopes of winning a new national franchise were dashed two weeks ago. Since then, there have been negotiations for the sale of the station to London News Radio, the company which will take over the LBC licence when it expires in October. The receivers say that LBC is trading profitably and that while those talks continue, the capital's oldest commercial radio station will stay on the air. Today's staff expressed hope that a deal will be struck. I hope that the transition can be made quickly and smoothly and that when LNR comes on air, it can take with it much of the good side of LBC. In theory, the receivers could take LBC off the air before the licence runs out in October. But with the new franchise holder anxious to inherit the station's audience, this looks an unlikely possibility, at least for the moment. 32 men have been bound over to keep the peace after yesterday's disturbances at a Luton mosque. A hundred riot police were sent in after worshippers barricaded themselves inside. Magistrates heard they were armed with sticks and baseball bats. Hundreds of people had gathered outside the mosque in Westbourne Road. The 10-hour occupation followed the removal of a priest. It came to an end when negotiations failed and police smashed down the door using scaffold poles. Earlier, they'd cordoned off the building to stop clashes between rival factions. The family of Asiatic lions are set to become a major new attraction at London Zoo. They were brought together for the first time today since the cubs were born six months ago. Arthur, his mate Ruchi and their children are the only pride of the temperamental lions to live together in this country. Arthur has taken well to playing dad to Max and Bruno, but is still wary of Ruchi, whom he hasn't seen since they mated. There are just 350 Asiatic lions left in the world. And that's it. Now back to Tim. Thanks, Gwenon. Now, 7,000 people lost their jobs when the Royal Naval Dockyard at Chatham was closed 10 years ago today. It was a body blow for a community in which nearly one in five were left unemployed. Today, shipbuilding has been replaced by tourism, but unemployment is still above the national average, and the old dockyard casts a long shadow. Robin Gibson reports now from Chatham on the legacy of the dockyard. I regret to inform the House that the base and dockyard in Chatham will have to close in 1984. Work at Portsmouth Dockyard... It came like a hammer blow to a community which had lived and breathed ships in the Navy for more than 400 years. It had been the first naval dockyard established by Henry VIII. Nelson's flagship Victory was built here, and through two world wars and up to the Falklands, Chatham kept the Navy afloat. Then, suddenly, it was all gone. Hard-earned skills on the scrap heap, whole families out of work. The overriding feeling continues, the workforce was dumped. As far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's, a, that's a graveyard of 7,000 jobs, and, and uh, until they put something viable in, in its place, uh, I don't want to know. This is the dockyard today. 
20 million pounds has been spent to create a living museum. Some of those who lost their jobs still work here. It attracts 120,000 visitors a year, but it's almost a ghost town by comparison with the great days. Well, you might say that the dockyard was uh, a town in its own right. Um, any process that was needed to uh, maintain a, a naval ship or even to store a naval ship was going on in here. We could manufacture almost anything, do almost anything. For some, the yard has left a sinister legacy of ill health. Earlier this year, former nuclear worker Rudy Molinari won compensation after his claim that he contracted cancer as a result of his work. Tim Robson also has cancer. It is a very difficult thing to actually look back with nostalgia on something that can have actually caused you illness. But in saying that, at the time, it, we, we were all very young people and there was a certain atmosphere that you can't help but uh, look back on and regret that it's now lost. Ten years on from the closure and the work is still going on to try to attract new jobs to the Medway towns. This is Chatham Maritime, part of the old dockyard, where there is a major development with a long-term dream of new shops, homes and a new business lifestyle. A lot of people who had good foresight said at the time of the closing of the dockyard that it probably would be the best thing that ever happened to the Medway towns. If you look at the statistics, yes, we had something like 18% unemployment at that time. When we got to the beginning of 1990, we were down to 4.5% unemployment. And in true terms, that means that you've got a lot of skill shortages, a lot of difficulty in finding the right people to match the right jobs. So far, 2,000 jobs have been created here despite the recession. A business atmosphere light years away from the shipwrights and the roadmakers. Robin Gibson in Chatham. Children who dream of driving trains will have to pay attention during French classes in future. The Channel Tunnel rail link between London and the continent means drivers of the new Eurostar fleet must be bilingual. Some of British Rail's finest have been over there to learn the language and to marvel at the latest rail technology. Mike Donkin went with them. Petit déjeuner for one of the 60 British railmen who will soon steer high-speed trains through the Channel Tunnel. There's homework to finish now, though, before heading to a daily destination that makes different demands. Quatre, exercice un. La réponse? Conversation practice isn't easy for a group whose schoolboy French is a distant memory. Je comprends un petit peu, mais... En Angleterre. Three weeks Très intensive bien. language training in France should help them liaise with continental colleagues and deal with passengers. We will be in radio contact um, with the signalman on the high-speed line in France, and they'll be speaking French, and there are procedures to do, technical procedures, which are obviously in French, so it is very important. France's domestic TGV trains are the nearest the visiting railmen can get for now to those they'll eventually drive from Waterloo to Paris and Brussels, once they're all built and tested for the tunnel. Computers like this will provide sophisticated fail-safe systems for a cruising speed like the TGVs of 185 miles an hour. On the English side of what'll be the new international tracks, a less than state-of-the-art route learning train is ferrying groups of French trainee Eurostar drivers up and down from London to Dover. They note the speed limits through junctions and engineering works which characterize the Kent Coast commuter line, a line which must carry an extra 15 million tunnel passengers a year until a high speed link is complete next century. The French are astonished. For us, it'll mean losing a lot of time coming from Paris to London. This side of the tunnel will be traveling at half the speed. The French would never have thought of starting the tunnel service without a new line. It's daft. While the French team take the controls in Kent to get in a little early practice of driving more slowly, in a village outside Lille, Phil Smart's language learning day stretches into the night. He's staying en famille with a schoolmaster. Good wine and a typically generous French dinner are accompanied by copious conversation. Phil, demain tu vas à l'école toute la journée? Oui, pour oui. dernier jour. Dernier jour. Oui. His hosts have only praise for Driver Smart's progress. 
is French, is better, is man English. <laughs> That's man English. <laughs> A boost to the Entente Cordiale even before the tunnels open. Mike Donkin. Now, sport. Here's Steve. Thanks, Tim. The British Athletics Federation has been hearing evidence against its promotions manager, Andy Norman, today. A disciplinary hearing was set up following the suicide of the Kent journalist, Cliff Temple, who it's alleged had been threatened by Mr Norman. Now, if the allegations are found to be true, the most powerful man in British athletics could be sacked. Andy Norman has had his brushes with athletics officials before, but this is the one likely to end his involvement with the sport. Mr Norman, the British Athletics Federation's promotions director, is accused of making allegations that journalist and coach Cliff Temple sexually harassed a female athlete. Mr Temple later committed suicide. Mr Norman's allegations have been said to have contributed to Mr Temple's death. Today, the disciplinary hearing called upon six witnesses, one of them, Eamon Martin's coach, Mel Batty. I was on a plane on August the 1st going to Cologne for the uh, uh, Grand Prix meeting, and uh, after Andy Norman read the paper, he said, what do you expect uh, uh, from someone who sexually harasses athletes? I was witness to an incident in Stuttgart during the World Championships on the night on which Colin Jackson broke the 110 metres hurdles record. Um, when Cliff's arm inadvertently caught Andy Norman's and Andy turned round and called him a pervert. Mr Norman has so far not made any comment on the allegations. I think everybody involved with athletics and involved with the media recognises that Andy Norman is extremely good at his job, extremely competent. Certainly, so far as I'm concerned, it's got nothing to do with being a witch hunt. He is good at his job, but if what the allegations suggest can be substantiated, then I don't think he's got a part to play in British athletics. I think he's got to go. A decision on whether or not Andy Norman remains in British athletics will be made next week. Now, on a much happier note, Arsenal have given themselves a great chance of reaching the European Cup Winners' Cup final in May. Last night in Paris, they held the French team Paris Saint-Germain to a one-all draw in the first leg of their semi-final. Ian Wright hadn't started an away leg in Europe this season before last night, but he quickly made up for it with Arsenal's goal on 34 minutes. The French side began the second half with a rally which first saw Nigel Winterburn clear off his own line and then the equaliser from David Ginola. Later, Alan Smith had a tremendous opportunity to make it 2-1, prevented by the French goalkeeper. But Arsenal go into the second leg in a fortnight's time, knowing that as long as they can prevent Paris Saint-Germain from scoring, they're through to their first European final for 14 years. And we've heard that that final will be staged in Copenhagen today. That's the sport from now. And finally tonight, a bravery award for Heather Mills, the model who's fought to rebuild her life after losing a leg when she was hit by a police motorcycle. The award was presented by the Prime Minister, Mr Major, and Heather went to Downing Street to get it. Here's Fiona Ball. Heather Mills' modelling career was thought to be in ruins after her accident last August, but her courage and sheer determination to carry on have proved remarkable. Despite losing her lower left leg and receiving internal injuries, Heather was almost completely recovered within a month of the accident, helped by an intensive regime of daily workouts and physiotherapy. Today, that bravery was recognised when she received a Daily Star Gold Award from the Prime Minister. It's just another challenge, isn't it? It's just like, OK, now I've lost my leg, I'll get on with it, and then I'll learn to walk and run and ski and swim and do whatever I want to do. It's just another thing. You're either a positive person in your life all the time or you're not. Among the other award winners was Rebecca Stevens, the first British woman to conquer Everest. The Kent journalist spent 15 minutes on top of the world last May. Heather, meanwhile, has had two operations since her accident and her career has been given a new lease of life. I'll do everything that I've done before. I've, um, we've just designed up a cosmetic leg with a guy called Bob Watts of Dorset Orthopaedic. He's the best prosthetist in Europe and um, it's made of silicon and it was completely human. The funny thing is, that the least important thing to me was having the cosmetic leg, which everybody thought would be the most important because I'm a model. But it was mainly the sport. I'm so into sport, I just wanted to be able to, to walk and run again. She now plans to take part in the swimming and skiing events at the 1996 Paralympic Games. And this summer, she'll be walking up the aisle when she and her boyfriend get married. Story of Heather Mills. Let's get the story on the weather with Rob McElwee. Thanks, Tim. Yes, it falls to me to give you the forecast for the Easter break. 
So before I give you that bad news, a quick look back on what's probably been the warmest day uh, for the next five, six, even seven. Yes, we had 16, 17, 18 degrees in many places in the southeast today. It wasn't quite as warm on the south coast. Worthing is just an example of one place where it's only 12 Celsius. Now 12 is 54 Fahrenheit, 18 in central London is 64 Fahrenheit, so a spread of 10 Fahrenheit in just, what, 100 or so miles. Tonight, things change. It's clouding over already. The rain's coming in. This is a computer simulation, so it'll be raining before we go to bed, and it'll be dry again before we wake up. The rain streams through. This is showers piling in even in the early hours of the morning. So it's going to be a wet and also a very windy night. That'll keep temperatures up, 9 or 10 degrees, 10 to 50 Fahrenheit. You wake up to dry weather, but I think it'll turn to blustery, showery weather, and it'll feel nothing like as warm as today, 12 or 13, but with quite a wind chill on it. And unfortunately, the further we go into the Easter outlook, the cooler it gets, it still stays windy and it'll be showery. And here's Wenon again with the BBC headlines. Pressure is continuing to mount on the Prime Minister. There's now a widespread belief on the Tory backbenches that John Major will face a leadership challenge in the autumn. And the government's announced big cuts to its road building programme with a number of projects shelved in the southeast. Winding of the M25 will go ahead, but several other schemes have been dropped, including the M12 in Essex.